We love him because he first loved us. We love him. And there's a because. Because he first loved us. Now I'm going to come back to this precious verse at the end of this message. Would you turn with me to Luke chapter 8? This is a very familiar passage of Scripture, but I wish we could listen to this like we'd never heard it before. Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, the hard, beaten, unpenetrable path. And it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And others fell on good ground and sprang up and bear fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Do you know you have to have ears to hear before you can hear? And if you have ears, let him hear. Verse 9, And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, unto you, it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The gospel. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. These are the seeds that fell on the hardened path. And you know I get this. How many men do you see out in the world that are so hard-hearted that the gospel has no effect on them? Steely, hard, unbeaten, the beaten path. Verse 13, they are in the rock, or they which when they hear, receive the word with joy. This is a great message. We love this. It makes sense. I like what I'm hearing. I don't know how many times I've heard that. They receive the word with joy. This is great. I'll be back next Sunday. I've heard that so many times. They receive the word with joy. But these have no root. which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, they fall away. I I didn't sign up for this, the troubles that have been brought on by the gospel, the inconveniences that have been brought on by the gospel, so they leave. Verse 14, And they which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth, and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring forth no fruit to perfection. They hear the word, they believe the word, but gradually the cares of this life, the lust for riches, the pleasures of this life choke the word. And I don't think these people necessarily leave, but they bring forth no fruit. 
they sit there and they never bear fruit. Now the good part, verse 15. But that on the good ground. Now, this ground had something done first. It was plowed up. The rocks were removed. It was watered. It was prepared before it received the seed. It's what the old time writers called prevenient grace. Grace before grace. The reason this ground received the word was because first something had been done previously for that ground. And what happened? But on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart. Now you know what that is. That's the new heart that he gives. No man by nature has a heart like that, but those whom God has mercy on, he gives them a new heart. It's honest. It's honest before God. It's good, pure. The heart that David cried, create in me a clean heart. And what does it do? Having heard the word, keep it. And bring forth fruit. The fruit of God the Holy Spirit with patience. But something was done to this soil first before the seed was received. Hence, good ground. We love him because he first loved us. Grace before grace. Grace preceding human knowledge Grace preceding human action. Grace preceding human response. Prevenient grace. To hear the gospel, you have to be given hearing ears before you can hear. I love the way the Lord said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. To see and understand, you must be given seeing eyes. Why, it even takes Preceding grace, prevenient grace, grace before grace to receive grace. I can't even receive grace. I can't even believe grace without the grace of God first coming to me. I turn to Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to look at several scriptures. Verse 5, very familiar verse of scripture. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Question. Was Noah included in that demographic? Yes, he was. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was included in Genesis 6, 5, but thank God for eight. verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, Solomon. Solomon was called by God the beloved one. Before he was born, before that David had even heard of Bathsheba. His mother. In chapter 7, he told Saul, uh, David, you're going to have a son and he's going to be beloved of the Lord. It was said to Zacharias, you're going to have a son and his name is going to be John. Now, he hadn't been conceived yet. He hadn't been born, but you're going to have a son. And his name is going to be John and he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He shall be filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. Well, somebody says, well, well, what if he doesn't believe? Will it happen then? <laughs> He'll believe. He'll believe. Because this was predetermined by God. This was grace given before this man had any existence. He says to every one of his people, before 
I formed thee in the belly. I knew thee. Many will say, Lord, Lord, did I not preach in your name? In your name did I cast out devils? In your name did I not do many wonderful works? Then shall I say unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Never was a time I knew you. I don't know you now. I never will. But to all of his people, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Jeremiah 31, 3. Behold, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. A love that never began. I, who understands that? Nobody. But we believe it, don't we? Behold, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. 2 Timothy 2, 19, The foundation of the Lord standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Romans 9, 11, For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Not of works, but of him that calleth. Now I'd like you to turn with me to this passage, if you would, if you would 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. Verse 9, let's begin in verse 8. Paul says to Timothy, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who hath saved us and called us. Now, which came first? The saving or the calling? He saved us. And everybody he saves, he calls. The call of invincible, irresistible grace. He saved us and he called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Grace before grace. Now, everything God does is eternal. I become more amazed by this, more flabbergasted by it, and yet knowing I don't understand it, there's no way we can understand eternity because we're bound by space and we're bound by time. And it sure is hard to get hold of this. As a matter of fact, it's impossible. But do you know that there is an eternal covenant? One that never had a beginning. It's what David called, although my house be not so with God, yet hath he made with me an everlasting covenant. Ordered in all things and sure. There's an eternal surety. The Lord Jesus Christ, who in a, before time began, took full responsibility for my salvation in eternity. There's an eternal sacrifice. We read in, he, in Revelation 13, 8 of the blood of the everlasting covenant. There is an eternal priest, the one who's the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, eternal. There's an eternal people that have always been known by Christ, that have always been loved by Christ, that have always been in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look what verse 10 says though. Now we had this grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. That's what he did on Calvary's tree. He put it away. 
and he hath brought light and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I'm appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Well, Paul, don't you know that there's no need to preach if everything's already ordained before the foundation of the world? That's foolishness. Of course there's a need to preach. Verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Now, everything that was done in eternity. I was justified in eternity. You know, some people were afraid of that. I have no idea why. Um, I was, everything that I have was given me in Christ Jesus before the world began. Everything. But it's just as true that I was justified when Christ died on Calvary's tree. That's when my sin was put away. He was delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. I was justified when I believed. I didn't have a reason to believe God had anything for me until I believed the gospel. And one of these days, when I don't sin anymore, and I stand before God absolutely just, perfect, just like Christ, I'll be justified then. You see, that which is done in eternity will always be done in time. Hebrews 1.14 speaks of angels who were sent to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. They shall be. They're not yet, but they shall be. You see, something was done previously that made sure that would take place. Before they call, God says in Isaiah 65, before they call, I will answer. And while they're yet speaking, I will hear. Listen to this scripture. The steps, the steps of a good man. And that's every believer. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Every step you have taken. Today, 10 years ago, when you were a kid, it's ordered by the Lord. I love that. Somebody says, well, you're making me a puppet. I'm fine with that if I'm the Lord's puppet, aren't you? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps, everything you do. You see, Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them who are the called according to his purpose. You see, something was done in this purpose. Grace before grace. Free grace. Don't you like free grace? It has absolutely nothing to do with you doing anything to gain it or earn it or have it. It's free. It's called abounding grace. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. It's called exceeding grace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, my grace is sufficient for thee. It's sufficient grace. You can have one thorn in the flesh, you can have 10 million thorns in the flesh. Doesn't matter. His grace is sufficient for you. We read in Ephesians 2 of the exceeding riches of His grace. And Peter spoke of the God of all grace. Now, I want you to think of the grace that came to you before you experienced grace in this life. What all the Lord did in His providence to cause you to hear the gospel and believe. There's a man returning from Jerusalem. He's gone there to worship. He's coming back empty as he was when he came. He knows the God of Israel is the true God, and he knows he doesn't know Him. He's gone to Jerusalem. He's coming back. He's reading the Scriptures. He has no idea what they mean. Isaiah 53. Unbeknownst to him, God had spoken by the Spirit to a preacher by the name of Philip who was preaching in Samaria. And there was a great revival that took place and the Spirit told Philip, leave there and go into a desert place 
called Gaza. And he goes into that desert place, and there he sees that man reading the scriptures. And the Spirit said, go join yourself to that chariot. And here he comes, and he asks this man, do you understand what you're reading? All this happened while this fellow was reading the scriptures, and he didn't have any idea what was going on. I want you to think, when, when the Lord came to you and revealed himself to you, before he did it, you didn't know what was going to happen. You didn't know what he was going to do for you. I, every one of us have a story, don't we? Every one of us have a story as to how God caused us to hear the gospel. Now, I believe that the clearest, most foundational scripture for this, what I'm talking about now, is the one we read at the opening of this service. We love him because he first loved us. We love him. Who's the we? The us he first loved. That's simple, isn't it? We love him because he first loved us. The folks who love him are the folks that he first loved. And we love him, not as we should. Do you feel good about your love to him? I know you don't, not if you're a believer. Not as we would. We would love him perfectly. We would love him without sin. We would love him, oh, more love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earnest plea, more love to Christ, O Christ, to thee. More love to thee, more love to thee. We, we don't love him like we should, like we would, or like we will. Oh, one of these days I'm going to see him face to face. I won't have to look down. I, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just be enveloped in his love. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. Now, we love him. We love everything about him. We love every one of his glorious, excellent attributes. There isn't anything about him we don't love. We wouldn't change anything about him if it were our power to do so because he's altogether lovely. He's perfect. We love him. We love his holiness. He's the Holy One of Israel, altogether other, and how we love him for that. We love his sovereignty. We love the fact that everybody's in his hands and he's the first cause behind everything and he's in control of everything. How we love his sovereignty. How we love his independence. He has no needs. I love it when he says, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. The cattle on a thousand hills are mine. We love his independence. We're so dependent, he's so utterly independent. We love him in his immutability. Jesus Christ the same. That can't be said of anyone else or anything else. We change every 10 seconds. Well, every second. Not him. Jesus Christ the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. We love him in his, I guess this is a word, <coughs> in his eternalness. He never had a beginning. He'll never end. He's the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. The universe is not a drop in the bucket to him. We love him in his omnipotence. He's able to save me with no help from me. He created the world and that was easy work for him. He is able to save the very chief of sinners. We love his omniscience, his wisdom, his way to make a way for God, his Father, to be absolutely just and yet justify and save and accept somebody like me. Don't you love his wisdom? Oh, the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love his omnipresence. You know, you can't go anywhere where he's not. Well, how can that be? I don't know, but it's still so. He said that uh, um, 
the Son of Man, look right here in John chapter 3, which is in heaven. I'm in heaven right now while I'm standing here on earth. Somebody says, well, he's not in hell. Listen, the, the fires of hell are fueled by the attributes of his justice. There's nowhere you can go where he is not. We love his love. When with the ransom in glory, his face I at last shall see, twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. We love his mercy. We love his meekness, his humility. Isn't that astounding that the God of glory, the creator of the universe, is meek and lowly in heart? How we love him as the friend of sinners. He's the sinner's friend. If you're a sinner, how do you answer that? If you're a sinner, he's your friend. He's the friend of publicans and sinners. He's altogether lovely. How we love his salvation. <coughs> How we love him thinking about him standing as my surety and taking full responsibility for my salvation before I was ever born. Don't you love him for that? Oh, we love him in his incarnation. I'm flesh. He had become flesh too to save me. How we love Him in His law keeping. When He who made the law was over the law, submitted to being under the law, and kept the law for me. How we love Him in His death. When He willingly left those soldiers. As a matter of fact, He willed them to do it. When they were driving the nails in His hands and His feet. He was willing them to do this because He knew that's the only way His bride would be saved. How we... Love His righteousness as our righteousness before God. How we love Him as an intercessor representing us before the Father even now. How we'll love heaven because we're with Him and we're like Him. Every believer can say with Peter, we love Him. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. I can't fool you. You know how unstable I am. You know how sinful I am. You know how inconsistent I am. You know how contradictory I am. I can't, I can't fool you. You know exactly how I am. You know all things. And you know I love your person. I adore your person. There's only one feeling I know of that's better and more enjoyable than the joy when the Lord gives you the grace to consciously adore Him and love Him. I mean, that's a wonderful thing when we're enabled to do that. But let me tell you something that's better. To be loved by Him. That's better. We love Him. We really do. We love him. I know I, I'm the spokesman for a bunch of people here. You said, we love him. Because. Because. He first loved us. I think of this love of eternal union. I I'm so amazed at that scripture in Ephesians chapter 5. I believe it's in verse 27 when it says, He that loveth his bride loveth himself. And so close is the union between Christ and the believer that when he's loving you, he's loving himself. I am the vine. You are the branches. And the stem that goes through the vine goes through the branches. There's no connecting point. One. There's never been a time when he didn't love me. He said, as the Father hath loved me. Now, how did the Father love him? I couldn't possibly describe all the ways the Father loves him. It's so glorious. We love to put our 
toes in the ocean of it, but we can't grasp it. The Father's love for the Son. Oh, the beauty of the Son. But the Lord Jesus Christ said this, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. His love as my surety when he willingly took the complete responsibility for our salvation. Now I want you to think about this. In that eternal covenant that David said, it's all my salvation and all my desire. When he took responsibility for me, like Judah did for Benjamin, of my hand shall thou require him. At that time, everything God required of me, he looked at Jesus Christ the surety for. We love him in his incarnation because the children were flesh, he became flesh as well. We love him in his obedience to the Father's will to save us. We love him in his death because I have no doubt, I don't understand this, but when he was hanging on that cross, my name was on his heart. He knew me. That's true of every single believer. You know, I, I know this is speculation, and I, I want to I be careful when I say this, but when he was in that grave, when he opened his eyes, I have no doubt that the first thing he thought was, of, was, I've glorified the Father. That's what I came to do. I've glorified the Father. But the second thing that he thought was, I've got my bride. I've saved my bride. Their salvation is accomplished. So, oh, how... He loved us when He ascended back into the glory as the Lord of hosts, bringing all of His elect with Him. And how He loves us as He sits now at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning, interceding for His people, representing them, controlling all things for their good and His glory. And how we love His return. And how He loves the thought of His return in returning to be with us forever. Now, He's coming for those He loved, His elect, His bride, His brethren, and we love Him. Oh, how we love Him. And we say, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. That's what ought to happen to him. And we know this. Oh, we're so sure of this. If we love Him, there's only one reason. Because he first loved us. Thank God for the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love him because he first loved us. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you that you first loved us. And Lord, we say with shame that we know we would have never loved you had you not first loved us and given us the love wherewith we love you. Lord, we confess salvation is of the Lord. And Lord, how we thank you for the revelation of your love, for the revelation of your gospel. Lord, we ask that you'd give us the grace to believe thy gospel. And we ask that you would give us grace to love you and love you more. Forgive us that we even have to ask for grace to do this. But Lord, we do. We're so sinful that we will not love you. As ashamed as we are of that, if you do not enable us to. But oh Lord, what joy there is in being enabled by your grace to see your glory, to love who you are, to love how you save. And Lord, we confess it's because you first 
loved us. In Christ's blessed name we pray. Amen.